it's time to talk about one of the most underrated, perhaps underappreciated American directors ever. This is the American director, Hal Ashby, and I'm gonna go through each of his movies quickly and chronologically, I'm gonna talk about why you should watch Ashby's movies, which ones you should try, which ones are the best, what his major themes are as an auteur, and why we should appreciate Ashby a little more these days than we do. So let's talk about the American director, Hal Ashby, coming up next. <laughs> very likely if you're watching this you're either a subscriber or a straggler coming in you're curious you don't know how ashby at all or like me you're an ashby enthusiast to the core probably the ashby movie that you know no matter who you are is being there if you haven't heard of this movie it's the famous last movie starring peter sellers the great british comedic actor is one of the most memorable final shots in movie history as well. I once had an international politics professor who talked a lot about 19th century philosophy, actually. He just loved the movie, being there for a whole lot of reasons that would make sense if you read, say, Nietzsche or Kierkegaard. Why should you watch Ashby? I think he's a great example of a movie maker who combines two things you rarely see, at least I've rarely seen in movies. That is, one, he's an excellent satirist. He's usually got some serious targets he wants to go after, but it's light satire, it's not heavy, and you need to be a little bit clever in order to pick up on what he's satirizing. It's not usually that overt. Second, he's a great humanist. He believes, I think, that all characters as individuals are important and worth a lot, and he wants to honor, I think, almost all of the characters in his movies. And as far as combining of both of those, I think Hashby shows the way for those of us today who might want to do the same thing with all of his techniques, whether they're visual or auditory or both. Let me run through the Ashby filmography very quickly so you can get used to you know, what he made, which movies you might appreciate or even start with, in order to see if you are buying what I'm selling you here, which is that Ashby is legitimately a great director. So Ashby was in the filmmaking business for a long time, actually, before he made his first movie, his first movie as a director, that is. He actually won an Academy Award for the movie In the Heat of the Night as the editor of that movie. Well, he got his big break as a director in 1970 by making the movie The Landlord. Now you probably haven't heard of The Landlord, but this is perhaps his most daring movie that is visually. It's got a little bit of French New Wave influence. It messes with plot structure. It uses a couple of mockumentary takes and the subject matter is very touchy. I get the feeling that we're all, I mean, uh, everybody, you know, black, white, yellow, Democrat, communist, Republicans, old people, young people, whatever. Sure, it's a little bit. Only the finest thing in my shop, girl. My good, which one of y'all is next? Oh, honey, I may close this place with this child here. We're all like a bunch of ants. This movie stars Bo Bridges, who is phenomenal in this movie, actually, and he plays this sort of rich, white, elite jerk, but with a heart, who buys a housing complex, has a bunch of black tenants, and he goes and becomes a part of their life in the ghetto. This movie has what you would see in other Ashby movies, which is stark contrast, as I said, the rich white guy versus the poor black people. This movie has some of the most striking tonal shifts you'll ever see. It probably has a near record for tonal shifts, some of which will be abrupt and will be off-putting to you. I guarantee you'll laugh at some of this movie. You'll be infuriated by some of it. I think that's the point. The Landlord mixes very dark satire, very wry humor with heartfelt drama, with light comedy, and there's all kinds of various other shifts in tone in this movie. It's just a wonder to see him cutting from you know heartfelt drama immediately to a satirical shot. You probably haven't heard of The Landlord. Don't dismiss it, though. You can go read my review on Letterboxd. It's down there in the comments. I think you ought to try this movie if you've already seen one Ashby movie. Try this and don't dismiss it, even though it's his first movie. I think it's one of his best. Fantastic. What's fantastic? You, you being here, it's just fantastic. Are you with Vista? Is this some sort of a new program you're involved in, huh? Vista, right. Volunteers in service to America. Volunteers, huh? Yeah. You think I'm white, don't you? In fact, the first four movies to me of Ashby are just, just remarkable in that they sort of hit all of these tonal shifts that I'm talking about, or they combine all these tones. The second movie, one of his more famous movies for some people, it's in the Criterion Collection, 
It's the drama comedy, I don't even know what this movie is, Harold and Maude. Harold and Maude is about a young man. He's living with his parents and he really has an interesting fetish about death. He's in love with death. He's in love with thinking about murder and dying and those kinds of things. This movie has one of the best opening shots I think I've ever seen. It just makes me laugh to no end to watch the opening shot, which is full of several surprises. I suppose you think that's very funny, Harold. And in the early part of the movie, Harold, this boy, meets an older woman. By older, I mean she's in her 60s or 70s, named Maud. She seems like an older hippie. She's full of life and joy. And here you have your contrast between the boy who loves death and the older woman who loves life. And like in The Landlord, we're going to see if these two contrast, these two people who contrast can commingle or get along or amalgamate. This is a wonderful movie, and I think as you watch it over the years, I think if you watch this movie over a span of 30 years, your attitude toward it will shift. At some point, you'll love this movie. At some point, you'll hate this movie. I think this movie has, gives you all kinds of reactions. Watch it with a mixed group. I think you'll see all kinds of reactions in a group. A great movie. It's a satire, but it's heartfelt, as I said. Probably Ashby's best, or at least one of them. That's the most exciting thing in the world, Harold. To pit your own life against another. Yes. To kill the taste of blood in your mouth. The moment of truth. Now, Ashby's third movie from 1973 or 1974 is my favorite. It's one you've probably not heard of, but it stars the great actor, American actor Jack Nicholson. It's a movie called The Last Detail. This is actually, to me, a genuine anti-war movie, or sort of a quasi-anti-war movie. It doesn't take place on the battlefield, it takes place in the United States. And here you have two soldiers who are to transport a third soldier who's very young, who committed a crime on a military base. The third soldier played by a young Randy Quaid. He's supposed to go to jail for a long period of time, a military jail. So these two soldiers, one of whom played by Jack Nicholson, has to take this third soldier up to the military jail. And as they journey with this character, they start to like him and they want to give him a good time. But as it turns out, they themselves want a break and want a good time. So they take an entire week to get from one place to another when it should take them just a day or two. This is sort of a buddy road trip journey. It's sort of a journey across at least a small part of America. This movie is talking about the experience of America, what it's like to be a soldier, a soldier during or right after Vietnam what's it like to be part of a system and whether you should be a part of a system or not. And these soldiers are going to encounter as they travel and tour and have a good time a number of places, a number of different kinds of people. The plot goals in this won't be immediately obvious to you. You need to take the full two hour runtime to watch this and think through it. And again, I would watch this with a group of people who are pretty savvy movie watchers because once you get to the end of it, you'll see how literary it is, how complex it is. You'll be able to pick it apart. And I think once you think about this movie, The Last Detail, you'll enjoy it all the more. Who did you kill, Chief? Didn't kill nobody. Robbery. How much did he lift? Forty dollars. Forty dollars? Forty dollars. Shit. You're shitting me. I wouldn't shit you. You're my favorite turtle. The fourth Ashby movie, and remember, we're not out of this realm of satire and humanism. We're still talking about those two with all of his movies. This is a movie I dismissed because of its title and its cover. I thought this was going to be a wimpy movie about hairstylists. Of course, I don't care about that given, you know. So this movie called Shampoo is in the Criterion Collection, but I didn't watch it for a long time because I thought, well, given the title, I'm just not going to like it. Turns out this is perhaps, perhaps, Ashby's best overall complex movie. Well, what do you think? Dr. Feldman says that to a certain extent it's normal. What's that? Postnatal fragility. Uh-huh. But with me, it's really 
This guy just expected me to jump right into bed. I've got to feel something tender or whatever. I've got to know somebody. George, will you pick up on line two, please? Line two, George. Here Ashby's hammering home, Ashby and his crew, the idea of American lifestyles as glitzy, as glamorous, as about money, success, fame, and power, and just hammering away at this idea. I don't think you should start with shampoo. I think Harold and Maude would be a good one. Being there, which we'll talk about in a minute, is another good one to start with with Ashby. But shampoo, I would try this, the second or third Ashby movie I see, because I, I just think it's really good, really smart. It takes place during 1968, and I forgot to mention, you know, Ashby, definitely a liberal humanist, by the way. He doesn't seem to like the military that much. Of course, his, his whole career, most of his career is taking place during or after the Vietnam War. He definitely hates Richard Nixon, but he is questioning whether liberalism can survive, whatever that means, whether the hippie sort of lifestyle promulgated in the late 1960s can last or if it's changing what are we going to change into both as individuals as cult and as american culture the next couple of hal ashby movies made during the middle of the 1970s i don't like as much i think you should try these later one is called bound for glory it's a biopic of the american folk singer woody guthrie it is interesting to consider this movie as one of the first biopics it's sort of a grandparent to you know modern musical biopics whether it's queen or elton john or johnny cash movies about those characters here you've got woody guthrie the movie tries to lionize and show woody guthrie as a major major artist in american culture the movie he came up with in 1978 starring John Voight, Jane Fonda, and the great Bruce Dern coming home is a post-Vietnam War movie. This movie too, like The Last Detail, is anti-war because it shows you only the results of war, what happens to veterans after they come back home, what happens to the wives of soldiers when the soldiers are away. It gives you a sense of American malaise and the desire for protest, and the aftermath, generally speaking, of the Vietnam War. This movie Coming Home won awards at the time it was released. It got a great four-star review from my favorite critic, Roger Ebert. I think you should read Ebert's review. I didn't like it as much as Ebert did. I think this is more a movie of its time. But it's worth trying if you're an Ashby completist. The last movie I'll mention in this video is the movie Being There. 1979-1980, and this movie is based on a novel like a number of the movies I've already mentioned from Hal Ashby. It stars the great Peter Sellers as Chance the Gardener, a simple-minded guy. Is he stupid? Is he retarded? Is he just a slow learner? Is he just an interesting sort of fairy tale character? After his employer dies, he's let go and he starts to wander through Washington, D.C. Turns out he runs into some very powerful people who believe him to be all wise, all intelligent, and a great possible politician. And so you have this very funny satirical movie about Chance the Gardener, a simple-minded guy in Washington, D.C., rising up the ranks of power. Mr. Gardner, do you agree with Ben or do you think we can stimulate growth through temporary incentives? As long as the roots are not severed, all is well and all will be well in the garden. In the garden? Yes. In a garden, growth has its season. First comes spring and summer, but then we have fall and winter. And then we get spring and summer again. Spring and summer? Yes. <clears throat> then fall and winter. Yes. I think what our insightful young friend is saying is that we welcome the inevitable seasons of nature, but we're upset by the seasons of our economy. Yes. There will be growth in the spring. Movie definitely questions who the power elite are in America, whether they're all that intelligent, whether they have a clue what they're doing, what American democracy is about. All those kinds of questions come up. This is probably Ashby's most political movie of all. It's a slow build, but again, it has the same kind of blend of satire and humanism that I mentioned. And I do think Ashby evolved over time, but certainly as an auteur, 
He considers all of his characters special. And I think here at Chance the Gardener, very interesting character because now you don't just have sort of an ordinary human fully fleshed out character as you do in the other movies I mentioned. You have, as I said, an otherworldly sort of fairy tale like character. And a character who might stand for a concept, whether that's literally chance or risk or something like that. Now, after being there, you get a second phase of Hal Ashby's career. Very sadly, he got into drugs. Very sadly, his movie career sharply declined. If you go look at his 1980s output, you'll see it's very poor. It's very lowly rated. What happened to Hal Ashby? Maybe the same kinds of things that happened to some of his characters, including the character in Shampoo, for example, or The Last Detail. I hate to speculate about his life, but you know, he was a beloved figure in Hollywood. A number of actors and other people loved him. I think he had a very literary sense. He understood cinematography very well. He's got a great painter's eye, great director's eye. Also a great editor. As I said, he won an Academy Award for editing. And I think in most of, or all of these movies, you'll be hit by some edit that's just really remarkable. And we really have almost nobody, probably nobody, like Hal Ashby working today. In fact, very few figures in, I would say, that America in the movie history are like him. The one director I think is doing the work that he does is Alexander Payne, one of my favorite, I probably even my favorite director still working. Have you seen any of the movies I brought up? Which ones would you recommend to other people? And what do you think about these movies? Have you watched a Hal Ashby movie before? Please leave us a comment and let us know what your experience has been. Please check out my Great Director series for other directors I really like and appreciate. Please subscribe to this channel. Thank you. Have a great day.